My name is Aiden Geekin. I'm a first year cancer biology PhD student who's just starting uh, this week actually at the University of Colorado Anschutz. I would like to thank the team at OncoTarget for giving me the opportunity to talk about our recent publication with them. Over the past two and a half years, I've been fortunate enough to have worked in the lab of Dr. Justin Wong at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Wong's lab takes a multi-omic approach in order to interrogate novel regulatory genes driving various cancers whilst keeping clinical relevance at the forefront of the lab's work. In this recent publication, we looked into the functional differences and the clinical relevance of members of the Arspondin family in prostate cancers, with taking specific regard to Arspondin 2. Um, there are four Arspondins. They're aptly named 1, 2, 3, and 4. To understand why we began this project, why is in the lack of viable therapeutic options for post-treatment resistance prostate cancer patients. Oftentimes, patients will undergo surgery initially to try and resect the tumor. This will be followed by androgen deprivation therapy, ADT as we'll call it. ADT is a great and viable option for patients. However, patients will eventually grow to resist this option. So at this stage, doctors aren't really left with a lot of truly viable options. So that's where Dr. Wong and his team and myself come in to try and bridge that gap and provide some base level research in order to build and find you know, novel therapeutic targets. Arspondin 2 became a target of interest of ours for a few reasons, actually. One of those being a high rate of alterations and then also its presence in the oncogenic wind pathway. And then due to the secreted nature of it, that would allow, if it was proved to be a viable target, for easier antibody targeting because it exists outside of the cell. So in the paper, we see that RSPO2 is not just altered more frequently than the other respondents, but it is almost always overexpressed when it is altered. Even more interesting is that these alterations aren't just abundant, but rather we see them actually leading to worse survival outcomes. So it's not just a case of it's altered, but it's not really doing anything, these overexpressions are leading to worse survival outcomes. Um, this led to a suite of genomic interrogations, as well as some assays to try and uncover the implications of this RSPO2 overexpression in various cell lines, one AR negative and one AR positive cell line. In these studies, we came across some really, really interesting and fascinating results, many of which come from RNA sequencing which we're analyzing the transcriptome. Based on our transcriptional profiling performed on the cells with RSPO2 overexpression, mm -hmm. RSPO2 seemingly has some form of role to play in both epithelial mesenchymal transition, which we'll call EMT for short, and double negative prostate cancer subtypes, which we'll call DNPC for short. RSPO2 has been implicated before in EMT, but our connection to ZEB1 and TWIST1 which are known EMT drivers, appears to be a novel discovery. This is actually further corroborated when we see similar gene prof behavior profiles in patient samples of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patients, or MCRPC. Even more surprising, and frankly, maybe my favorite result that kind of came out of this paper, is that in these results and the overall transcriptional profiles, we found that the RSPO2 overexpressed cell lines were robustly different than the makeup of the CTNMB1 overexpressed cell lines. Uh, CTNMB1 is a key regulator in the Wnt pathway, entering the nucleus and altering transcription. And so, given RSPO2's believed role in the Wnt pathway, we hypothesized that these profiles would be decently similar. However, the robust difference between the two could be indicative of a potential role for RSPO2 and prostate cancers that exist outside of canonical wind signaling. There's actually a study from the Institute of Molecular Biology in Mainz, Germany from, I think, 2021 that indicates that an RSPO2 blockade mainly attenuated autocrine BMP signaling, which furthers that idea that the function of RSPO2 may extend beyond just regulation of wind. So the next steps of this project have a near endless array of possibilities. I think that continuing to probe that potential RSPO2 outside of wind existence uh, is a really fascinating avenue to kind of continue down. However, I think that what we're going to be working on in the immediate is 
the potential relationship with EMT and specifically with DMPCs. We've actually begun to look into DMPC samples with regards to RSPO2 activity and trying to establish a baseline for what DMPCs look like in clinical samples. As for me, I'll be continuing my training here at Colorado and continuing to collaborate and work with Justin and his team at Minnesota so that the aforementioned project that's a subsidiary of this can continue to exist and grow into another great paper that hopefully we can submit to OncoTarget as well. With that, I want to thank the entire team at Minnesota who have allowed me to grow and learn so, so much. Uh, with special regards to doctors Emmanuel Antenarakis and Justin Drake for providing crucial feedback throughout the entirety of this RSPON and project, as well as Allison Makovic for incredible contributions to the writing on this project. And finally, Justin Wong, whose mentorship and guidance continues to allow me and those around him to do great, impactful science like this pro aforementioned project. Mm -hmm.